My name is Marvin Perkins, welcome. And I was really enlightened by what President Gray had to say and he talked a little bit about skin color and how the Lord never referred to us in the scripture by our skin color. And so I'm gonna to touch on that just a little bit, skin color in the scriptures. And I'm gonna zip through this, but we'll have plenty of time to talk about this and get the references. As we talk about this, I wanna point out a couple of different things. We have something that I call widely accepted views, which I title the philosophies of men. And then we actually have the actual doctrine of the church, which is the scriptures or the word of God. And we want to kind of separate some of the darkness and bring us into the light. And the way to do that is by focusing on what we have revealed to us from the Lord through the prophets. Before we do that, I want to tell you a little bit about African Americans. The Higher Education Research Institute out of UCLA did research studies. They concluded in October of 2005, and it showed that African Americans were number one, the number one culture in the country seeking religion. Not only were African Americans number one, but in 12 spirituality categories, African Americans were number one in seven of those 12. Another research study, 2006 Yearbook of American and Canadian Churches, showed that the LDS Church is number one in growth in the country. And this was for 2005 and 2006. Also that the LDS Church is the fourth largest in the country. So you'd think you'd have a great marriage. You've got the African Americans who are the number one in seeking religion and the LDS Church, which are the fastest growing. So where are all the brothers? <laughs> well, this almost kept me from joining the church and it's the lack of knowledge that the members have regarding the 1978 revelation or the questions that African Americans have regarding the church. There's a great wall there that once we take it down through the information that President Gray shared with you earlier and that that I'll share with you now, once we have shared this, we've seen just the opposite. We've seen African Americans come into the church, come back into the church, and become stronger members of the church. So let's talk a little bit about how to reach African Americans. Uh, to do so, we have the formula down already. We take missionaries into our missionary training center, and we train them on language and culture, and we send them all throughout the world. We wouldn't dream of sending a missionary down to South America without teaching them something about the language and the culture of South Americans, or to Africa, or to Hong Kong, or wherever we send missionaries. So we study the language and the culture that people were called to serve. And so if we apply that same formula to study the language and culture of African Americans, it'll be easy to reach them and easy to understand how to reach them. So what is the language and the culture of African Americans? Well, first of all, the language is that, and when I say language, I mean those hidden cues, like I can meet another African-American brother and understand already a lot of what he has gone through. And so that's what I mean when I'm talking about language. So the language of African-Americans is that most African-Americans think that Mormons are racist, that uh, they have a long history of racism, and think that blacks are cursed. All right, and if you want to reach these people, you have to get comfortable with knowing that. Even if this is not spoken, this is what's being thought by most African Americans. And what's the culture? The culture is that every African American is gonna to have to deal with this issue at some point, either before they join the church, during the discussions, or after baptism, sometimes many years after baptism. So this is why it's key to understand this information. And if we have it, we can be strengthened. And when we don't, as has, as has been the case, this is why you see such a mass exodus. So let's talk a little bit about something I call don't take the bar exam without studying for it. There are many who will speak on this subject who have never spent one hour of study or 10 minutes of time on their knees praying about this to seek the answers and the truth. Don't speak about something you don't know. Would it, would it be if we sent missionaries out without a testimony of the restored gospel? 
it would be pretty ineffective with them going out saying, I think the church is true. I think Joseph Smith saw God in, the, uh, in Jesus Christ. I think that the Book of Mormon is the Word of God. It would be totally ineffective. So don't speak on an issue that you haven't studied or receive the testimony on through getting on your knees and asking the Father. This is what he told us about that, he being our Father. In DNC, Doctrine and Covenants 1115, Behold, I command you that you need not suppose that you are called to preach until you are called. Wait a little longer until you shall have my word, my rock, my church, and my gospel, that you may know of a surety my doctrine. DNC 1121, Seek not to declare my word, but first seek to obtain my word, and then shall your tongue be loose. Then, if you desire, ye shall have my spirit and my word, yea, the power of God unto the convincing of men. So again, don't speak about what you don't know. I've told you here, and Heavenly Father's told you, and that was much more important. All right, what are some of the issues that concern African Americans? One of the issues is skin color that we're going to deal with now, and we're also going to tie in curses with that as well. In a later segment, I'm going to deal with equality and priesthood. So let's deal with the skin color issue. There you have two beautiful women, one black, one white. As reported on World News in 2006 and also Good Morning America in 2006, and speaking of human genes, they say that we are all 99.9% .9 identical. In dealing with DNA, it is broken down by 3 billion base pairs that go into 35,000 genes. And of those numbers, only 10 have anything to do with skin color. Only 10. So when we have a gospel and a doctrine that teaches that we all come from the same Father, scientists are even helping us to confirm that. All right, so let's deal with the word black in the scriptures. I did a little research in the scriptures, and I found that the word black is found 44 times, 26 times in the Old and New Testament. And you see uh, where they are, nine are referring to the elements, hair, but only eight of those times refer to man. Only eight. And so we're going to explore those eight. And why don't we start here in Job. In Job 30:30, 30, 30, it says, My skin is black upon me, and my bones are burned with heat. Now my question for you, was Job black? Well, if he was, it wasn't such a bad thing. Look what the Lord says about Job. He says, There is none like him in the earth, a perfect man and an upright man. Job 2, 3. Okay, but was Job black? I don't know. Was Job anguished? That I do know. Job was anguished. Read Job 31 through 29 to find out if Job was anguished. All right, so let's move on. And Solomon, Song of Solomon 1.5, I am black but comely, O ye daughters of Jerusalem, as the tents of Kedar, as the curtains of Solomon. How about Solomon 1.6? Can we get a clue there? Look not upon me because I am black, because the sun have looked upon me. My mother's children were angry with me. They made me the keeper of the vineyards, but mine own vineyard have I not kept? I'm still not clear there, but I'm starting to see some similarities between that and Job. So let's move on. And let's go to Jeremiah 8.21. For the hurt of the daughters of my people, I am hurt. I am black. Astonishment has taken hold of me. Now here's where we get a little help. There's a footnote next to the word black. And you follow it down to the bottom of the page, and it says Hebrew idiom, meaning gloomy. Hmm. Let's go to Jeremiah 14, 2. Judah mourneth, and the gates thereof languish. They are black unto the ground. And the cry of Jerusalem is gone up. More help there. I look at the footnote, follow it down to the bottom of the page. Dejected. Did Job feel dejected? Did he feel gloomy? Hmm. All right, let's move on. Lamentations 4.8. Their visage is blacker than a coal. They are not known in the streets. Their skin cleaveth to their bones. It is withered. It has become like a stick. I didn't know what visage meant, so I actually had to look it up. And uh, I consulted a couple sources, both Webster's and American Heritage. The visage, the face, usually with reference to shape, features, expressions, etc. Countenance. 
that's Webster's, and then in American Heritage, the face or facial expressions of a person, countenance, so I'm getting some consistency here, appearance, aspect, the bleak visage of winter. What else did I find? In Joel 2.6, before their face, the people shall be much pained, all faces shall gather blackness. Follow that footnote down to the bottom, Hebrew idiom, meaning gloom. How about Nahum 2.10? She is empty and void and waste, and the heart melteth, and the knees smite together, and much pain is in all loins, and the faces of them gather blackness. Again, Hebrew idiom, meaning gloom. So it seems pretty consistent here. So I did the exact same thing of those 44, 18 times the word black was found in the Book of Mormon, the Doctrine and Covenants, and the Pearl of Great Price. Eleven times referring to the elements, hair, actions, paint, but only four times referring to man. And so I went and explored those four to see what they meant to me. And in Moses 7, 8, For behold, the Lord shall curse the land with much heat, and the barrenness thereof shall go forth forever. And there was a blackness came upon all the children of Canaan, and they were despised among all people. What does the blackness mean there? Moses 7.22, And Enoch also beheld the residue of the people, which were the sons of Adam, and they were a mixture of all the seed of Adam, save it were the seed of Cain, for the seed of Cain were black. What does black mean there? And had no place among them. Well, the 1978 revelation, most people think it gave the priesthood to blacks. Well, it actually gave exactly what a revelation is. A revelation is a, a giving of knowledge, of light, and it shed an awful lot of light on, and we'll talk a little bit about the 78 revelation and all that it gave. Was the revelation blacks can now hold the priesthood? Well, I think as we discover, uh, as we explore this, you're going to see that it was an awful lot more than that. But it also confirms the understanding that was, that was already set forth in the Bible. There was a statement made by Elder McConkie in August. He made it to CES. The teachers of the gospel, the CES, Church Education System, are the, uh, the group that is called to teach the members of the church. And what did he tell the teachers to teach the people? He told them this, we follow the living prophets. Forget everything that I said, or what President Brigham Young or President George Q. Cannon or whoever has said in the days past that is contrary to the present revelation. We spoke with a limited understanding and without the light and knowledge that has now come into the world. We get our truth line upon line, precept upon precept. We have now had added a flood of intelligence and light on this particular subject, and it erases all darkness, all the views, and all the thoughts of the past. With that flood of light, the brethren actually updated the scriptures in 1981. So the revelation came in 78, the flood of light and knowledge was received, and they actually updated our scriptures in 1981. So let's see how that modern revelation has helped us to understand what is meant by the word black. This is where a lot of African Americans, when I first started investigating the church, this is where I stopped reading the Book of Mormon when I read this particular passage because I wanted to get some clarity on this because it just didn't sound very good. It didn't sound like God. This did not sound like the nature of God and I needed to find out more. And unfortunately, the members didn't know. And so the more I asked, the further I got away from the Lord's truth simply because the members did not have oil in their lamps. So 2 Nephi 5.21 says, And he had caused the cursing to come upon them, yea, even a sore cursing because of their iniquity. For behold, they had hardened their hearts against him, that they had become like unto a flint. Wherefore, as they were white and exceedingly fair and delightsome, that they might not be enticing unto my people, the Lord God did cause a skin of blackness to come upon them. Now, before 1981, you did not have a footnote on the word skin. But after the revelation, the brethren updated the scriptures and 
felt compelled for some reason, inspired to put a footnote on the word skin. So you ask yourself, why? What do they want me to know? So it sends us over to 2 Nephi 30, verse 6. And this is what it looked like before 1981. 2 Nephi 30, verse 6. And I want to point out some key things here. But here is 6, and if you can read along with me there, silently. Uh, and then shall they rejoice, for they shall know that it is a blessing unto them from the hand of God. And their scales of darkness shall begin to fall from their eyes. And many generations shall not pass away among them, save they shall be a white and delightsome people. All right, so if you take a look at a couple of key things there. Number one, you see the word scales in there? It has no footnote next to it. All right, and also take a look, save they shall be a white and delightsome people. All right, so let's see what the updated version looks like. In 1981, the newer version of the scriptures. And then shall they rejoice, for they shall know that it is a blessing unto them from the hand of God. And their scales, new footnote B, you follow that footnote down to the bottom of the page, and what does it say? Topical guide, darkness, spiritual. Topical guide, spiritual blindness. So the scales that they're talking about are spiritual blindness or spiritual darkness. And for some reason, they put a new footnote on the word skin to take us over here. To me, it indicates that they're talking about spiritual darkness and not actually a literal changing of the skin color. Also notice something here is that here the word used to be white and delightsome, but it's been changed to pure. My research shows that Joseph Smith also changed that way back in 1840. It just never got into the updated scriptures, possibly because of all the persecution. But he changed it to pure. Two different references. One says because he feared that people would misunderstand its meaning. And the second one was because he thought it more closely fit what it was talking about. Okay? All right, so let's move on. Second Nephi. 521 and 2 Nephi 30, verse 6. Key passages there. Okay, and this is number four here. All right, so is this the only passage in all of Scripture that means black skin instead of spiritual darkness or gloominess? Well, 2 Nephi 26.33 reads, For none of these iniquities come of the Lord, for he doth that which is good among the children of men. And he doeth nothing, save it be plain unto the children of men. And he inviteth them all to come unto him and partake of his goodness. And he denieth none that come unto him, black and white, bond and free, male and female. And he remembereth the heathen, and all are alike unto God, both Jew and Gentile. All right, so when I read this, I first say, well, you know, my wife's Puerto Rican. Is uh, she not included in this? Only the black and the white? Well, are they talking about black and white, or are they talking about good and evil? Well, if you go and actually read verses 17 through 33 in that passage, you'll see that they're talking about the evil, the evil of men and all the evil that they do, and also the wonderful invitation that's extended to the Lord and the blessing that is given to those who actually receive of that invitation, accept of that invitation of the Lord. So it was clear to me that the black and white that were being spoken of were the evil or the unrighteous, and the white were the pure in heart or the righteous, and had absolutely nothing to do with literal skin color. So let's take a look at the word white in the scriptures. Maybe we can find something there that either supports or helps us to better understand. So I searched the scriptures again, all of scripture, and found the word white used exactly 104 times. 40 times in the Old Testament, 28 in the New, 24 times in the Book of Mormon, and 12 in the Doctrine and Covenants. And only 26 times did they refer to man. Okay, so I'm down from 104 to 26, made my research a little easier. And of those 26, 18 refer to leprosy. <laughs> <laughs> so let's explore those remaining eight just to find out uh, what's there for us. All right, now, what do you notice about the remaining eight? Anything? 
Yeah, they're all in the Book of Mormon. All right? So let's take a look at these. Of those 24 mentions of the word, 16 of them refer to 11 of righteousness or purity, one material objects, one hair, and three times it's talking about the fruit of a tree. All right, so so far white has not been used to describe skin color in all of the scripture with the exception of eight passages. Does the meaning differ only for the Book of Mormon? Not sure. I don't think so, but I'm not sure. Let's take a look at it. Again, Elder McConkie's statement, forget everything that I have said or what President Brigham Young or George Q. Cannon has said or whoever has said in the days past that was contrary to the present revelation. We spoke with a limited understanding and without the light and knowledge that is now come into the world. We get our light and our truth line upon line, precept upon precept. We have now had added a flood of intelligence on, and light on this particular subject and it erases all the darkness and all the views and all of the thoughts of the past. So everything you thought you knew, the brethren has asked you to forget it. And so where do you go for your new understanding? The scriptures. And isn't it great that they actually updated those scriptures for you to help uh, for us to help us to understand what they now want us to understand, what the Lord would have us to understand. And so we go back to our 2 Nephi 5.21, which we've covered, and it takes us to 2 Nephi 30 verse 6, which again we've covered. And there you see the scripture before 1981, and you see it does not have the uh, footnotes for the word scales, and it also has the word white and delights them, as you know, uh, was changed to pure. And then you have your new footnote for scales taking you down to the bottom of the page saying dark to spiritual, spiritual blindness. Now what's key about these two scriptures are that every scripture in the Book of Mormon that made you believe that the Lamanites had a darker skin than the Nephites, every last one of them have a new footnote on it leading you back to these two. Why would they do that? What does the Lord want you to know? What do the brethren want you to know? All right, so let's move on and let's investigate the others. Start with 1 Nephi 11:13. And it came to pass that I looked and beheld the great city of Jerusalem and also other cities. And I beheld the city of Nazareth. And in the city of Nazareth, I beheld a virgin and she was exceedingly fair and Puerto Rican. <laughs> It makes no sense to start calling out nationality at that point, does it? In 1 Nephi 13, 15, And I beheld the Spirit of the Lord, and it was upon the Gentiles, and they did prosper and obtain the land for their inheritance. And I beheld that they were white, and exceedingly fair and beautiful, like unto my people before they were slain. Now you follow the brand new footnotes for beautiful, which seem to be descriptive of fair and white. And it takes you where? To one of our favorites, the 2 Nephi 5.21. See, they're all tying in. Mormon 9.6, O oh, then ye unbelieving, turn ye unto the Lord, cry mightily unto the Father in the name of Jesus, that perhaps ye may be found spotless. Does that mean without sin? Pure. Does that mean without sin? Fair. Does that mean without sin? And white. Does that mean without sin? having been cleansed by the blood of the Lamb at that great and last day. It seems pretty consistent with that that we've learned already. How about 2 Nephi 26:33, And he denieth none that come unto him, black and white, bond and free, male and female. Again, go and read 17 through 33 if you want an idea of what's being spoken of there. You read about the evil that's being done and the great invitation that the Lord is extending and the blessings of those who accept it. Third Nephi 2.15, And their curse was taken from them, and their skin became white like unto the Nephites. Well, before 1978, you didn't have a footnote on the word white. You follow it now, and where does it take you to? It takes you to our two favorite scriptures, tying them in to those two, 2 Nephi 5.21 and 2 Nephi 30, verse 6. 
Also Jacob 3.8. And what does Jacob 3.8 say? It says, Oh, my brethren, I fear that unless ye shall repent of your sins, that their skins will be whiter than yours when ye shall be brought with them before the throne of God. Now, when we are brought before the throne of God, what's taking place? Absolutely. Judgment. We're being judged. Will our Father judge us on what we look like? We know the answer to that. So the skins being talked about cannot be literal skins. They have to be the spiritual darkness or the spiritual purity that is pointed out in the new footnotes at the bottom of 2 Nephi 30, verse 6. But just in case you wanted a little support, we'll go to 1 Samuel 16, 7, where the Lord tells us, But the Lord said unto Samuel, Look not on his countenance or the height of his stature, because I have refused him. For the Lord seeth not as man seeth. For man looketh on the outward appearance, but the Lord looketh on the heart. How about in 2 Nephi 21, 3? This is also found in Isaiah and shall make him of quick understanding in the fear of the Lord, and he shall not judge after the sight of his eyes, neither reprove after the hearing of his ears. All right, let's move on. We've got two more. Third Nephi 19.25, And it came to pass that Jesus blessed them as they did pray unto him, and his countenance did smile upon them. And the light of his countenance did shine upon them, and behold, they were as white as the countenance, and also the garments of Jesus. And behold, the whiteness thereof did exceed all the whiteness, yea, even there could be nothing upon earth so white as the whiteness thereof. You follow that footnote for white down to the bottom of the page. Topical Guide, Transfiguration. Not talking about skin at all. All right, this is the last one in all of Scripture, 104 times. This is the last one that could possibly pertain to literal skin color. Let's see what it says. 3 Nephi 1930, And when Jesus had spoken these words, he came again unto his disciples. And beheld, they did pray steadfastly, without ceasing, unto him. And he did smile upon them. And behold, they were white, even as Jesus. New footnote, you follow it down to Matthew 17, 2, and was transfigured before them. Again, talking about transfiguration, not a literal skin. So, the conclusion for the Book of Mormon, instead of 11 times, all 19 times refer to purity and righteousness. The remaining eight we apply to purity and righteousness as supported by the scriptures and the modern revelation. For all of Scripture, 43 times the word refers to purity. And the words black and white do not refer to literal skin color in the Scriptures. So, if we talk about skin, we also think about curses. And again, there are some widely accepted views, again, the philosophies of men, and then there are also the doctrine of the church, which is found in the Scriptures, the Word of God. So, President David O. McKay said, There is not now and there has never been a doctrine in this church that Negroes are under a divine curse. There is no doctrine in the church of any kind pertaining to the Negro. And so when you listen to that statement from President McKay, you have to apply it to your skin color that we talked about, the, black and the use of the words black and white. So... Some of us, again, and speaking of those widely accepted views, we just apply a definition of the word curse that has been passed down. Well, I actually looked it up in the dictionary, and there are 15 different definitions and uses for the word curse. How do we know which one to apply? All right, and here's the remaining 15. Take note of 9 and 14. Nine, an ecclesiastical censure or anathema, which is an excommunication or a driving away because of a punishment, some type of discipline. And then we see down in 14 to excommunicate. So let's see what the scriptures have to say about curses. Now, through my research and through my prayer, I have come to conclude that a curse is a separation from God because of sinful living. 
If we were to live sinful lives, we'd lose access to His Spirit. We would not be able to attend His temples and partake of His sacrament. And the Lord communicates our direction and His intelligence to us through that Spirit. And so the loss of that would cause a separation, thus a cursing. Now, let's see if the Scriptures actually support that. DNC 2941, Wherefore I, the Lord God, did cause that he should be cast out from the Garden of Eden from my presence because of his transgression, wherein he became spiritually dead, which is the first death, even that same death which is the last death, which is spiritual, which shall be pronounced upon the wicked when I shall say, Depart ye cursed. How about in Moses? And now thou shalt be cursed from the earth, which has opened her mouth to receive thy brother's blood from thy hand. And Cain said unto the Lord, Satan tempted me because of my brother's flocks, and I was wroth also. For his offering thou didst accept, and not mine. My punishment is greater than I can bear. Behold, thou hast driven me out this day from the face of the Lord and from thy face I shall be hid. Again, we see that separation because of what? Sin and wickedness. Let's move on. In Alma 3, 18 and 19, And now the Amalicites knew not that they were fulfilling the word of God when they began to mark themselves in their forehead. Nevertheless, they had come out in open rebellion against God. Therefore, it was expedient that the curse, or the separation, should fall upon them. Now I would that ye should see that they brought upon themselves the curse, and even so doth every man that is cursed bring upon himself his own condemnation. So if that's the case, a whole group of people are not going to receive some type of curse because the Lord is telling us here, every man bring it upon himself individually. Alma, again, 16 through 18. And now it came to pass that the king and those who were converted were desirous that they might have a name, that thereby they might be distinguished from their brethren. Therefore the king consulted with Aaron and many of their priests concerning the name that they should take upon them, that they might be distinguished. And it came to pass that they called their names Anti-Nephi-Lehi's, and they were called by this name, and they and were no more called Lamanites. And they began to be a very industrious people, yea, and they were friendly with the Nephites. Therefore, they did open a correspondence with them, and the curse of God did no more follow them. And if you remember the story from the Book of Mormon, this is where seven whole cities were converted unto the gospel. And as they began to have that correspondence with the Nephites, they began to live the gospel. They increased their proximity to the Lord, limiting their distance. Therefore, they no more were separated from His ways and His path. Let's go again to 1 Nephi. And it came to pass that the Lord spoke unto me, saying, Blessed art thou, Nephi, because of thy faith, for thou hast sought me diligently with lowliness of heart. And inasmuch as ye shall keep my commandments, ye shall prosper, and shall be led to a land of promise, yea, even a land which I have prepared for you, yea, a land which is choice above all lands. Inasmuch as thy brethren shall rebel against thee, they shall be cut off from the presence of the Lord. We see that theme going through several of these scriptures. And inasmuch as they shall keep my commandments, thou shalt be made a ruler and a teacher over thy brethren. For behold, in the day that they shall rebel against me, I will curse them even with a sore curse, and they shall have no more power over thy seed, except they shall rebel against me also. You follow that footnote for 23a for rebel. They are those that rebel against the light. They know not the ways thereof, nor abide in the paths thereof, because they're separating themselves from, because of sin, from the Lord and His ways. Second Nephi 1, 17, 18. My heart had been weighed down with much sorrow from time to time, and I fear lest for the hardness of your hearts the Lord God shall come out in the fullness of His wrath upon you, that ye be cut off and destroyed forever, or that a cursing 
again. You see how cursing and cut off from the presence of the Lord is being used here again. Should come upon you for the space of many generations, and ye are visited by sword and by famine, and are hated and are led according to the will and captivity of the devil. Second Nephi 4, 5 goes to give us the exact same thing. Wherefore, if ye are cursed, behold, I leave my blessing upon you, that the cursing may be taken from you and answered upon the heads of your parents. Why the heads of the parents? And again, inasmuch as parents have children in Zion or in any of her stakes, which are organized and teach them not to understand the doctrines of repentance, then it becomes the sin of the parents. 2 Nephi 4.34, O Lord, I have trusted in Thee, and I will trust in Thee forever. I will not put my trust in the arm of flesh, for I know that cursed is he that putteth his trust in the arm of flesh. Yea, cursed is he that putteth his trust in man, or maketh flesh his arm. Then let's go back to our favorite scripture, the 2 Nephi 5.20 and see if now that we've gone through it with black and white and had a little bit of understanding on curse, do we get a different understanding of what started here in 20. Wherefore the word of the Lord was fulfilled when he spake unto me, saying that inasmuch as they will not hearken unto thy words, they shall be cut off from the presence of the Lord. And behold, they were cut off from his presence, and he caused the cursing to come upon them. Yea, even a sore cursing because of their iniquity. For behold, they had hardened their hearts against him, that they had become like unto a flint. So again, here we see, because of sin, there was a separation. And cursed, let's jump down to 23, and cursed shall be the seed of him that mixeth with their seed, for they shall be cursed even with the same cursing. And the Lord spake it, and it was done. Now also note in 23 that there is a new footnote next to the word mix. That was one of the ones that came with the new revelation in 78. And now it has at the bottom, topical guide, marriage, interfaith. So the scripture never dealt at all with interracial marriage because the Lord wasn't talking about in a race. They're talking about people who came from literally the same father, the same father in heaven and the same earthly father, Lehi, and the intermarriage they were talking about was interfaith and not interracial. So is interracial marriage wrong or right in the sight, in the sight of God? Well, we're all the Lord's children. And the brethren through the revelation, the Lord has made it clear that the marriage that they're talking about, the mixes, is inner faith and not interracial. Alma 3, 8 to 10. And this was done that their seed might be distinguished from the seed of their brethren, and thereby the Lord God might preserve his people that they might not mix and believe in incorrect traditions. That was the reason why that they might not believe in incorrect traditions. And it came to pass that whoever did mingle their seed with that of the Lamanites did bring upon them the same curse upon his seed, or the same separation from the path and from the ways of the Lord. Therefore, whoever suffered himself to be led away by the Lamanites were called under that same head, and there was a mark set upon him, that mark being spiritual darkness. Alma 3.14, Thus the word of God is fulfilled, for these are the words which they said unto Nephi, Behold, the Lamanites have I cursed, and I will set a mark upon them, that they and their seed may be separated from thee and thy seed from this time henceforth and forever, except they repent of their wickedness and turn unto me, that I may have mercy upon them. 2 Nephi 2, 14 and 15, And it came to pass that those Lamanites who had united with the Nephites were numbered among the Nephites, and their curse was taken away from them, and their skin became white like unto the Nephites. Again, follow your new footnotes down to our two favorites, uh, 2 Nephi 5, 21, and 2 Nephi 30, verse 6, still tying them all together right back into those same scriptures uh, that gave us the new light. Also, our Jacob 3, 8 is there. 
the Articles of Faith. One of the Articles of Faith, the second one, says we believe that men will be punished for their own sins and not for Adam's transgressions, which actually confirms the words of President McKay when he says there has never been a doctrine in the church that Negroes are under a divine curse. So curses are simply a separation from God because of wickedness. Thank you. And with that, if you have any questions, I'd like to take them now. There was no wording that says black couldn't take a priest, you know, couldn't have a priesthood. Why was there a revelation needed to allow blacks to take a priesthood? If those in leadership thought and decided that there was a revelation needed, that would be, in my mind, the only reason. There was a time back in the 1950s where they had realized that there wasn't any reason for this withholding and that it was policy. And as a matter of fact, we'll cover that in a little more detail. However, there have been many, many statements on this issue by church leaders or church members that would make it really difficult in their mind, and I'm only guessing, to make such a drastic departure from what they had been doing without revelation. And the beauty of that revelation, though, is that it gave us so much more understanding. If the change was just made, then we would still be reading those same passages and thinking the same things, but yet we're just doing something different now. So the beauty of that revelation is that it gave us so much more light and knowledge and ties the Book of Mormon and the Bible together. There are a lot of pictures that still don't change, and those pictures are the ones that sell the deal. Everything is very white, very European. There's nothing in Central America, nothing in Africa that shows anything like that. So are they going to change the pictures? This is my major question. And you know something, I have no idea what someone else is going to do. And I really am not as motivated by that. The whole purpose of doing such a forum is to show those what we do have. And with that direction, they can do their own study and get on their own knees and find out what the Lord would have them know about this. Do we have a lot of information here? Absolutely. But again, I have no idea or desire to motivate anybody to do anything other than pick up the scriptures and learn what the doctrine, the real doctrine of the church and not what the widely accepted views are. What we're trying to do is reach the people who truly have ears to hear and let them know what the Lord feels about them through His Word. And, and then we'll let everybody else uh, answer to the Lord on uh, how they uh, deal with His stewardship. Any others? Yes. Um, I don't recall the scripture exactly in the Book of Mormon, but where it's describing the Lamanites at the first, and it says something about a dark and loathsome people, but it also, the way it's describing them, it sounds like it's saying that they became very unwashed and uncouth. So do, do you think that sometimes what they're meaning is just that they were dirty? Um, I know for myself that they're not talking about skin color. I know that for a fact. And so with knowing that, I'm not trying to apply any other meaning to it, simply because I've done what we are inviting all to do, to read the scriptures and to feast on what has come through the 1978 revelation and then petition the Lord to gain your understanding. Now, I don't remember anything, reading anything that says anything about unwashed. So I look at that, until I read that, I look at that as one of those widely accepted views or philosophies of men. To me, that's not scripture, and the scripture clearly indicates to me that they're talking about sin, and sin is, sin is loathsome. I have a sister over there. Um, I just had a comment about, is two comments actually. If I was listening to the comment that was asked earlier by this young man up here, 
and he said, why are all the pictures white? And I don't think that all of the pictures are white. I think that if I'm created in the image of God, then I have a picture of Jesus that looks like me in my home. And so um, I just think that it, it all depends on where you're at and what your interpretation of what people look like in the Bible are. The interesting thing about it is that regardless of Jesus' skin color, he actually came down here and died for every last one of us. And his sacrifice and his atonement have no color. And it's, it's, it's genuinely the work of Satan to try to find a way for us to take our differences and use them to elevate ourselves above each other. And when we do that, be it skin color, ability, economics, anything, we're failing the test that we were sent here for. Thank you.